Kia ora koutou katoa. My name is Selena Armstrong and I'm the Chief Executive of ShopCare. We're a charitable trust established to improve health, safety and well-being outcomes for workers in the retail sector and our supply chain. Thanks to our partnership with ACC, we're developing a range of initiatives to reduce harm to workers in our sector. One of our key areas of focus is violence and aggressive behaviour, we call it VAB. We know this risk is prevalent amongst all customer facing roles. We recently launched four online training modules covering situational awareness, managing an angry customer, staying safe and a course for team leaders and managers on preparing workers before, during and after an event. These courses are free at the moment for a limited time and can be found on our website shopcare.org.nz under the workstream violent and aggressive behaviour. While a lot of focus is on managing the harm of VAB, we want to put more effort into harm prevention. So how do we stop violence and aggression before it occurs? There are a lot of controls out there that can be put in place. However, some of these are costly and it does put them out of the reach of many retailers. So we want to provide information on additional methods that can be implemented by anyone able to take the time to learn. This is where Scott comes in. Scott Taylor, our speaker today, is a combined communications expert and a security, safety and risk specialist with almost 30 years of global industry experience. He's trained with global leading authorities on body language, deception, detection, word and statement analysis and a range of other related disciplines. And today he's going to share some of his, some of his knowledge with our community. He'll be sharing insights on the physiological changes that people with bad intent show. With an enhanced awareness of these indicators, frontline retail workers can be better prepared to deal with the various situations they face as part of their everyday work. We're excited to be offering our community the opportunity to learn to identify these important cues to keep themselves and their workmates safe. Now we're recording the session today um, and if you have any questions please type these into the Q&A tab and I'll present them to Scott at the end of his presentation. So thanks very much Scott, I'll hand that over to you now. Thanks very much for the opportunity to present today. Um, so I'll share screen and, and we can um, get into that now. Okay. So the session today that we're going to be running through is just to, to give some depth and I suppose a different angle for how we look at working through and identifying and de-escalating conflict and also some of the circumstances we deal with in and around the retail space. Post COVID and due to a range of things that we have as well, uh, cost of living crisis and, and everything that comes with that, we're seeing increases in, in a range of, of escalating stress and frustration that can go into violence and aggression. Now, some of the traditional methods we've taken, we've taken some physical elements from looking at things from a crime prevention through environment design approach. We've also then also looked at some procedural elements as well. What I want to try and do is to pr try and pass on some skills in around the focus from the people-centric approach. The thing is, people that come in and around the retail space, if they have bad intent, they show that. They show that with their behaviours. And so what I'm going to run you through today is some of the things that we can pick up there so how we can best position our people to keep them safe and well. When it comes to some of the behaviours we're going to see, some of the items I'm going to step through for you will cover elements of some facial micro expressions, some of the other physiological changes that occurs from a body language and then from the overall behaviour point of view. The thing is from seeing these behaviours and from doing, like you're picking up these items, we still then have the decision on what the best steps are, but at least we're making a more educated decision and because we're more aware of these things early, we're in a, in a safer space to be able to work out from that risk-based approach, whether we get some additional resources and support from an approach when we disengage or what things we do, like how we deal with that. But it gives us the best position and the best chance to be able to, to work through and get that more, more positive outcome. The thing about this is thinking about things a bit differently. Now, because of some of the training that we have and because of some of our own bias, when we have these interactions, sometimes we get stuck in the in the script or we focus on some of the things we shouldn't be focusing on. So the key thing about being present and being able to pick up these changes in nonverbals, especially from people with bad intent, we need to try and clear our mind and be very present during those interactions. 
the other thing to understand is depending on the intent that people have and aside from people that are attending site that have uh, anti-social crime or other parts as part of what their their drive is or the focus is even from the different type of shoplifter that people are like their, their style will will display elements of different behaviors so i've got a couple of different examples up there as well the desperate the opportunist the thrill seeker the booster the kleptomaniac and the absent-minded depending on their style their approach their, their makeup they will show different elements of those behaviors those, those physiological changes but either way the thing is because the brain knows what it knows, people will show you the, their behavior, their intent with these physiological changes. We can pick these things up. But to do that, we need to be present. We need to be looking for and to get what I call the baseline. People in and around the retail space, they move with a certain um, uh, cadence, like you're with their gait and they work you know, for, with purpose as well. The way that they look at things in the aisles compared to and the items they're looking at compared to people that are there with bad intent is also different. But we need to be present, like I said, to pick some of these things up. So from where we're sitting, and, and I suppose the reason why it's important, I mean, the um, the last summary from the, the Retail NZ survey has put the annual cost about $2.6 billion. That's including the crime prevention-related expenses and costs, what we're trying to do to try and remedy that. But the other part, and I suppose the most concerning part, is threatening behaviour and damage reported by more than half. And that's, that's just re re what's reported. The sad thing about being in elements of our industry is when I speak to people in the front line and I speak to them about some of the things that they deal with from some of the stress, frustration and elements. Mm -hmm. And the saddest part is, is hearing them say, that's just part of the job and just dealing with that. And, and that's something that, that I just can't accept. So although there's a range of items driving the behavior and causing these sort of things, um, there's things that can be done and we can't just accept that as being par for the course. I mean, we're seeing similar spikes in, in retail, in healthcare, a range of other parts where in some of the figures I'm getting back, you know, there's spikes of, of aggression ranging from 110 up to 140% over the last couple of years. And so that's why we really need to look at taking that bit of a different approach. The other thing with these things spiking as well is that even organised crime is getting more organised and, and the sad approach, like a, a sad thing with this is uh, criminals don't take holidays <laughs> And often they're doing some more from continuous skills development than what than what we can be doing. And so that's why I thought of, of you know that today was important that although we're doing all these other elements with the physical and electronic as well, is we still need to have the people-centric elements because regardless of what we pick up with a CCTV or some of the analytics and things that we can get, we still need to have the people skills for what to do, what's our next step, how we're dealing with that. So right now it's never been more important for us to be able to enhance our ability to glean the true intent of people. Now, just to clarify what I mean by that, that's not just the people coming in and around the retail space shopping, even from the recruitment point of view, the skills that we have about being more present and about gleaning true intent for people similarly cross over to from the recruitment point of view with the people that you're hiring that have done their resume up on chat GPT. We want to be able to understand that they best fit people because obviously how damaging that can be for getting the wrong person into your organization. So what we want to do is said is, is to, to first go, go through and talk about the skills for enhancing our awareness and doing that. Now, sadly, we are just not aware. We are so device centric with what we do and our focus is so split on the busy work days that we have. Um, that's why I've got the image up there that you probably find a bit laughable. Canada, China, Belgium and South Korea have TWW lanes, text while walking lanes because they've had such dramatic increases of people being injured while they're out and about in public and on their phones. Couple your work pressures and the things that you're dealing with, and especially in any semi-stressful environment, plus device focus and other parts, we're not aware. And because we're not aware, we're missing a range of these items. So the first thing we need to do is we need to clear our mind and understand with the interactions with the people that we're watching or engaging, having those proactive chats with, even just with the meet and greet as well, we're looking for what they're not telling you with their words, but they're showing you with their behavior. And we do that, as I said, by being present. I need to get through a couple of slides there where I, you know, it's not disturbing images, but like yeah, to give you some background as to why these things work, because I'm always asked, does this work for everybody? Uh, and in short, the answer is yes. The evolution for picking up changes in nonverbal communication, while it's been going for years, a lot of work with Ghulam Dushan, who uh, basically his study was elect putting electrodes in the facial mus muscles of the people he was studying to see if he could replicate facial uh, micro-expressions. 
and realize that those those expressions during his testing are across all the, the broad spectrum of all the people that he tested. Dr. Paul Ekman went across to uh, remote Papua New Guinea and other parts as well, where there was less than 200 people in the villages that had no access to media and had never seen another face. They also had the same facial expressions for fear, happiness, surprise, all those items as well. David Matsumoto did a study in 2004 of athletes who were blind from birth and showed that they had the same facial expressions and even similar gestures for winning as, as, for, as seeing athletes. Exactly the same expressions for happiness, sadness, anger, contempt, all those items as well, even though they had never seen another face. Now, aside from then, from the gesture point of view, from the, like, yeah, from the facial micro expressions and these elements, if on top of all that evidence about it being working across cultures, regardless of background, regardless of being seen or not, during university did a study when they had babies in the womb and when the mums are under stress and duress, the babies would touch this part of their face 18, more than 18% than the mothers that weren't under duress. It's the same spot that people touch when there's deceptive behaviour or severe discomfort because stress hormones release the cortisol and that causes them to lick their lips, to get a hard swallow and to touch that part of the face. So the people in around you with deceptive behaviour or bad intent will show you those indicators. So these things are innate. They're part of us, not just us, the animal kingdom. This is the facial expressions of a tiger getting released in the jungle after it's been in captivity, which is the same combination that we would have of fear and surprise. So the same elements with the eyes, mouth opening, and like and these sort of things. So they're part of us. But the thing is to understand what then the body language elements and what we see. Um, we used to walk around on all fours. And when that was the case, all of our vital organs, veins, and arteries recovered. Now that we stand up, they're not. And so when we're vulnerable or when we have some bad intent, when we're concerned that people are watching us, we'll cover some of those areas. Now, those main zones we look for, and especially in around the retail environment, are our ventral area around the chest and our power zones being under our chin, our belly button and groin area. People with discomfort will cover those. So as they're coming in and around, like you're, like you're the stores and retail area, they'll duck their chin for covering this area. When you come to speak with them, they'll do some things that they'll slightly angle their body across or away. That's their part subconsciously already telling you that they're reducing your access to these vulnerable areas. But there's a whole range of tells that come along with that. And we'll speak about some of those as we get to the next couple of slides as well. The thing is being aware and present. Even the fact that with the way that we communicate and that we've taught like the staff in the retail area for meet and greet sets the tone for the experience, but also lets people know that we're more aware and connected. Now, the premise for getting these things is underpinned by one very simple concept. People with good intentions want to be noticed. People with bad intentions don't. Mm. So we want our people, whether it's front of store, whether it's people working in the, che the checkout areas or whatever that we have, to be to note for that split second with the people that they see, that they make that direct eye contact and let people know that they have their full attention. You have been noticed. That is incredibly powerful. The smile you see in this slide here is the one we see, which is your everyday smile we get. Hey, how are you? It's also completely fake and not driven by emotion because there's no crinkling around with the eyes. So the face elements, and I'm going to give you some examples now of some of the main ones, can give us a lot just in that first interaction. 43 face muscles will give us 10,000 combinations, but out of those different combinations with facial micro expressions that we have, and we'll touch on here and then we'll do some about the body as well, can tell us a lot. Here's the seven main facial um, expressions here. The ones that I want to spend some time on are surprise, fear, and anger. Because they're the ones that, like in the environment that people we're dealing with, if we're coming up to, to just proactively offer service or try and assist somebody of it as well, there's no natural reason for them to be showing fear, surprise, or anger. If that's the case and you see these facial micro expressions coupled with some of the other physiological tells, then we've got to think what else? What's driving that behavior? What has driven that response? So some of these items you might see if you're going up and there might be somebody that's going through and we'll get to some of the behaviors they do and the difference in how they look, how they physically inspect shelves and what they do. But you may go up and get, and they might be just say, hey, can I help you with something? If people have one of these, like the surprise or fear, and that's supported with a one-sided shoulder shrug, that's always showing that the people are, are lacking confidence and have some element of concern with the words that they're speaking to you about now. So that's why then we look to further investigate and watch their behavior after we've had that first interaction. 
So we're in through a couple of these. Surprise. This is what surprise looks like. So if you speak to somebody and they're walking around and all of a sudden it's, hey, can I help you with something? And you see this micro expression, the eyebrow pulled up as well, eyelids pulled up, eyes wide, and the mouth being like you're being hanging open. Fear, the mouth goes to the side. Surprise, it opens up. Um, there's a lucky reason. Are they why why are they surprised? And especially if there's fear, fearful of the interaction that they're having with you. It is the same with everybody. So just to clarify, and for those that saw the awards where I think Will Smith um, slapped Chris Rock, here's everybody's faces there. You can see the same elements of surprise carried across the faces, except for one or two people there that thought it was quite comical. So these expressions, as I said, are universal. We see that with people. Here is fear. Now, there is no reason why persons should have a logical fear response as part of an initial greeting or service offering in and around the retail space. You can see the eyes opening. The difference that is the mouth pulls to, pulls to the side. So these things, they happen rather quick. It can happen from one twenty-fifth of a second through to three seconds is the average length of some of these uh, facial micro expressions. So you're not going to pick them up unless you're present and making and you know, looking for that contact. So that's fear, regardless of who it is. Like that's the that's the elements that we see from that facial micro expression. So we look for those with fear. This is fear in its truest form. <laughs> this is a horror house in Canada where people go through 20 minutes of absolute terror and then they walk into a room that says, you're safe, you've made it. Then it looks like a car drives in there at about 150 kilometers an hour. So you can see the same parts. What you can see down here at the bottom though is the combination of, fear, of surprise as well as fear. Mouth to the wide, outlet to the side, end open. And that's why. So I'll show these comical examples just to give you some suppose, strong indicators like, as to what that looks like. Here's the other one that's of concern for us, anger. If we're dealing with people and anger is in essence interference with goals, people that are coming in that have that bad intent, being that shoplifting, any social um, activity, whatever else, if by us getting involved with them, having their discussions, we see this, the facial micro expression of anger, and you can see there the chin thrust, I like up look that we get for things as well, uh, sometimes with the tightening of lips, but the other parts as well, like the eyelids, upper eyelids, like you're pulled up and that furrowing that we have, if we see that micro expression of anger, we also look for some of the other physiological tells on that because on, we're looking for pre-aggression and violence indicators. Now, there's a whole bunch of those. I'll, I'll put them forward in Scott speak or the way that I communicate. Here's a couple. I call it chicken chest and bodybuilder lats that we get some inflation with the chest and then we get the arms going out and these sort of things. Confident and dominant people take up space. That's why those people that are trying to blend in and try and not be noticed, they do the opposite. They will slightly withdraw their body. They move their arms 12 to 15% less than others. The fact that they're trying so hard and putting more effort to try and blend in and not stand out is ironically what makes them stand out. But we want to pick up these elements of anger and pre-frustration and pre-violent indicators. Compression of the jaw, uh, expansions on the vein of the side of the neck, compression around with the fist, we see from another body language point of view, tightening of the lead shoulder and often placing weight on the rear foot as well. All these things happen over the space of a couple of seconds. Now, the thing is, if our people aren't present and aren't aware of what some of the pre-conflict and pre-violent indicators look like, then we could potentially have them in a bad position. That's why passing on some of this training about the awareness for non-verbal communication can be so important. From an anger point of view, here's some further ones that we said about for that, like yeah, that tightening, firing with brow and other parts as well. So just so we get a bit of a feel for what that's like. Post all into these workshops, and especially when I do the um, half-day ones and longer ones, you start seeing facial expressions everywhere. Um, so post that, you're going to have even doing this part, but, you know, this sort of short workshop, some more of that. I mentioned before, confident, dominant people take up space. It's not just us, it's a natural thing. Think when there's somebody coming up and there's a complaint that occurs at one of your counters. What's the, what do people do? Their arms come out, they tack up, they claim more space at the counter and they lean in. They're trying to claim more of the other person's space. All these things are indicators as to the person's emotional state, the amount of space that they're trying to take up. So we look for that, look for changes and transitions in the baseline, the way that they communicate. We look for expansion with these things. And you can see here, it's probably the first time you've realized why tigers have the um, white there on their ears because even when they're drinking in other parts as well, it makes them look bigger. And this griffin vulture up the top, everyone thinks that this is its whole head. It's only the little small bit there. The rest is all for show. 
all for making it look more dominant. Same as what we do when people all of a sudden have some frustration and anger and we puff ourselves up. So we need to train our people to look for these sort of things because even with these absolute killers with the tigers and, and other parts, it even happens with some of the most lethal, most vicious <laughs> animals in the world taking up more space. It's a natural thing. So we need to train our people to look for these sort of items. So now that we've run through some of the science and reason why, I want to talk about some of the other specifics, some of the key takeaways. So these are some of the things that we should be looking at for our people to, to identify the difference. Arm movement reduced by 12 to 15%. I'm not saying the whole um, like Dharma, like he used to do, like you know, the, the serial killer um, by com lit con controlling his arm movement entirely. But people who are trying to draw less attention to themselves will move their arms less to try and blend in. So they don't want to think they're not standing out with their movements. They'll dip their chin and you also potentially see some shoulder rising. We call this turtling. It's once again, them trying to not stand out as much and to try and withdraw a little bit. And that's the byproduct of that is them trying to cover up their ventral area. That's what's driving that. Blink rate is another one that, especially when we're having an interaction, as humans, we blink between 12 to 14 blinks per minute. Under stress and duress, especially from deceptive behavior and with bad intent, that skyrockets to 20 and 30 blinks per minute. Now, whilst that may sound like you, know, you literally have to lean forward and look, you get very quickly used to what that's like. And when you're getting 20 to 30 blinks per minute compared to your normal 12 to 14, it stands out a lot. You will really start to identify this. The other thing we look for is avoidance behaviors, the way that they're acting as well. And with the items, looking if they're really over-examining like you're while buying and looking then also the other part is the eye reference line. It would be reasonable for people to be looking at shelf line and other parts. It's not reasonable, normal behavior for them looking at your security elements, for constantly doing what we call validation glances or looking askance over their shoulder. So these are some of the things that we should be training our people to look out for as well, looking for their eye level, their eye, eye levels and eye contact levels. Some of the other things that we see as well, uh, the what they're carrying and bringing in, you know, large bags, looking for distracting behavior. And that's some of the things that, that sadly we, we don't pass on with our people. If you see people that have some of these other physiological elements that were, they were saying there as well, the arm moving a bit less, ducking their chin, all these other items. And on top of that is, oh, can you see if you've got this item and something out of stock, that can be distracting behavior trying to move people away as well. Um, the other thing is, look, we, we look that when people are looking them on the shelves, if they're browsing for something in an area, that their eye contact is more people-centric. They're looking at the people around them, regardless, plain clothes or uniform or whatever, rather than item. If they're there for purpose, then people-centric eye contact is a deviation from the normal eye contact of people that have that outcome and purpose. The other thing is, changes in cadence is really, really important. In speaking cadence, we look for RSVP, rhythm, speed, volume, and pitch, but also changes to their walking cadence. If when they're on site and they've been walking around a certain time, then there's a rapid escalation in their walking cadence towards the exit. There's another indicator for you as well. When they do that, if there's rapid acceleration towards the exit without interaction, that can be quite a strong indicator as well, especially when added on top of these other items. Some other things that I mentioned like here as well is about looking for groups that come in and then split up. There's a really strong indicator and the individuals then can show some of those behaviours, especially the people-centric communication and others, whether it's spotters, other people involved. I really want to make sure I reiterate something about the pre-aggression indicators because sadly we miss a lot of those. When we're dealing with somebody, so if see somebody who's got that um, people-specific eye contact and, and some of these other behaviours then, as part of the approach, if you come up and speak with them and you see that they start doing a bit of a hand rub or an arm rub that they haven't been doing while you've watched or seen any part of their behavior, that's called a self-pacifying gesture. Now, our, that's our brain saying, I've got some element of stress and duress. Can you soothe me? So our body does repeat type of, of actions to try and soothe the brain. Self-pacifying gestures like this are an indicator. If that turns to scratching as well, then that's an even stronger indicator. Pacing, which we all see as people get some stress and frustration, if you think about that, is another repeat rhythmic action. It's another version of a self-pacifying gesture. So we look for those. Then the other elements that I mentioned, just to, to refresh like on that part as well, we look for things like expansion of the vein of the side of the neck, clenching of fist and jaw, um, dilation of pupils, all these other things. The other one that we miss 
is rubbing of the forehead and rubbing at the back of the neck. They're showing escalating tension that the person as yet hasn't worked out the trajectory of how they're going to respond, but there's escalating tension or concern about this interaction. And that's why people need to be trained to identify and pick up a range of these elements because otherwise they're just going to miss out on them. And it's really important for us to stay centered on those. Breathing is another one, which is one that I mentioned, but can be hard to pick up. If we normally will breathe and especially relax. The more relaxed and calm we are, we breathe lower and looking towards our diaphragm. But under some element of stress and duress, aside from closing our power zones and doing these things, our breathing raises up and becomes shorter. So shorter, sharper breaths and these sort of things. So what we're looking for is clusters. The strongest indicator that people are there on your site with bad intent is when there's been some ticks or items in multiple communication channels, a change in speaking cadence or inflection, a change to their gait, self-pacifying gestures, facial micro-expressions, when there's a combination in a couple of those showing that discomfort and potential deceptive indicators, that's some really strong indicators for lucky for you that people are there with bad intent. But as that occurs, remember, we still need to think, what else? What I want you to try and do with this content is to try and overcome some of the myths that you have. If you're speaking with people and they maintain less eye contact, that doesn't mean that they've got deceptive behavior. That could be their baseline. They lack confidence. We look for a deviation. Somebody with their arms crossed as they're standing around doesn't mean that they're lucky that they're closed off or guarded. That could be their resting spot or it could be cold with the air conditioner, the temperature in there. So once again, we look for deviations. But we look for these, some of these main items said about confident people taking up space. So people that have bad intent will withdraw and reduce some of their movement and the way that they stand. Reduced arm movement, they'll change their gait. The other thing is some of the things like in now, and this works for personal dynamics, not just you know when we're checking people with bad intent. They're saying belly away, I want you to stay. When you're dealing with people and there's some discomfort, if they angle that belly button and this ventral area away from you in either way, or look at their feet, belly away, I don't want you to stay. We, we're out of just being, I suppose, polite and calm. We'll turn our upper body to speak with people. So when you're having discussion with these people, because you've picked up one or two other indicators, quickly just glance down and see their feet. If the feet are still pointing away from you in that belly button area, they've got some discomfort and they don't want to continue on that conversation. So I want you to think why. What's driving that behavior? So we're mindful of these power zones and ventral area and any changes to covering off those making sure we're passing on to our people, looking for some of these pre-violence indicators that can happen quite rapidly. But if we're present and seeing how people communicate by that initial bump, that initial just genuine question, love to help you with something like, yeah, is there anything I can assist you with today? Being present with direct eye contact, letting them know for that split second, they've been noticed and all of my attention is about you. People with good intent are going to love that, be recognized and think, wow, this is great customer service. People with bad intent are going to say, this is not the place to ask for us to be doing what we want to do because we're going to get noticed. And then we get that movement and displacement. So that's why we focus on those things. So some of the other behavioral elements I said is, like, yeah, we also want to make sure to think what else, what's driving. So if we see a person that may be showing that, um, compared to what we had think for that baseline movement, they're doing that over examining. They're showing people centric eye contact rather than product centric. And there's a, we might have an initial discussion with them. There's one or two items that like they get some nervousness or think what else? Let's suspend our judgment, think context. You know, is there something, are they, would they be stressed because they're on their lunch break and is getting close to the end of lunch or they're short on time? Are they short on money and there's some budgetary concerns? A range of things can drive people's behavior. So we need to be present and think what else, but then through our interaction, through our questions, through watching their behavior during that time, we can see how that expands or continues. That's how we work through and that's how we validate some of our judgments. Now, the things that I'm sharing today, I'm not saying in any way replace all the elements about the physical approach, the procedural, the electronic. There's no silver bullet here. There's no panacea. But as far as it goes for our focus and intent, we need to do what we can to keep our people safe and well. The outcome of these other items about trolley locks and additional cameras and, and things that we have like are all great and they all have their part. But some people-centric element and focus is incredibly powerful. It, it works to enhance your service like as well and the, the tone of the, the service experience on site. 
It works to detract and reduce what's occurring potentially from a theft or antisocial crime, but it best positions our people to make educated decisions. And the hardest part for that is removing bias and having them present. But if they can get that right, the benefits for this can be endless. Uh, so here's my summary details. I, you know, I um, asked to keep it like around the 30 minutes so we've got time for questions and these sort of things as well. Uh, so, yeah, please let me know if there's any questions or feedback or other points as well. I'm always happy to um, to answer any of those. Fabulous, Scott. That was great. I find this area um, really interesting. It's fascinating because I think that there's so much opportunity for us to share this knowledge and it makes it's very, very accessible, unlike a lot of other, you know, um, methods that we have to undertake to try to keep our people safe this one is really really accessible which is what i like about it yeah. um so if we've got any questions from the audience please type those through so we can um i can ask scott but in the meantime um i guess from my perspective what's the best way of uh developing capability in this space is it really just about putting this knowledge into practice how would you suggest we do it best yeah i mean so the thing for this is getting some content and material out there and and i suppose for increasing the uptake with people in the various teams is also letting them know that the this this interaction this awareness works for every element of their life being better connected with people being more present with what we do and identifying some of those behavioral tells increases their personal relationships inclusive increases their awareness like in safety so that's a big motivating element the thing is then having this dedicated time um Sadly, I'm going to use another Scott phrase. What happens is we often whale watch. A new piece of technology comes out or a new change and we all run to that side of the boat. Let's do this. Let's all run this. And, you know, then the next bit comes, we run to that side of the boat and our boat becomes unstable. We need to understand that this training is is a, is part of a solution. It's part that gives multiple outcomes. And, I, and I, I strongly think that it's a strong part of the reason forward because even where it sits works with the other elements. If you think if you have this right and this additional training and looking for deviations in behavior, that could be done from a cluster, from a centered, even clustered point of view across numerous stores where we're watching some of the changes in behavior patterns in gate and other parts as well. It allows us for more effective selection and placement of resources. And like I said, I think the crossover, the fact that it enhances the service experience as well, you know, everyone's got a role to play in security, safety and, and conflict mitigation. And I think this squarely fits in, in enhancing people's ability to do that. Fabulous. Well, thank you very much for your time today, Scott. Um, I've really enjoyed hearing about the work that you do and the insights that you've shared. We'll be looking at other opportunities to get you in front of our shop care community to continue to build on this knowledge and awareness for the, our retail workers. Like I said, it's a really affordable and accessible a method to prevent harm to retail workers. And I look forward to collaborating with you again soon. In the meantime, if you'd like to hear more about the workshop care are doing and keep across our training and event opportunities, just head to our website at shopcare.org.nz and register as a community member for free. And you'll get access to all the elements that we're delivering um, as part of our harm prevention strategy in the retail sector. Thanks for joining us and have a fantastic day. Thanks very much.